This video is brought to you by Fabulous. Click the link in my description and start building your ideal daily routine with 25% off a premium Fabulous subscription. So in a few videos now, I've made small nods and vague allusions to talking about this one character and this one ship. It's the only thing that has the power to actually get me talking about BBC Sherlock again in 2022, which is in and of itself kind of impressive. And that's because I wanna talk about fanon and fan creativity in general. Oftentimes, when a large community of fans concentrate around a certain show or book or movie, some of their fan activities will revolve around expanding the world and making little collective decisions about how certain events and characters will be interpreted. Sometimes that's very small and simple, like fans deciding two characters who don't really talk in the original work are friends, or fans making up nicknames for characters. And other times, they'll uh, invent a brand new character out of thin air and talk about that character like they always existed and invent elaborate lore for the made-up character, and that's what happened with the Sherlock fandom on Tumblr. When I say the Sherlock fandom invented a brand new character out of thin air, that's not entirely accurate. It's, it's more like they invented a brand new character out of a speck of dust, and then somehow reconstituted that dust into an entire person. They alchemied a completely new character and acted like he was always there, and it was great. Let me be clear, I say they. What I'm revealing to all of you today is probably my number one fandom interest slash hyperfixation from my teenage years. This ship owned my life for like three years. I owned merch related to this ship. I bought my friends merch related to this ship. I wrote loads of fan fiction for it. I spent tens of thousands of words doing email role plays about it. I maintained multiple separate side blogs on Tumblr dedicated specifically to this ship. This was my existence. And so it's with that in mind, let me take you on an exploration into several things. First, I want to talk to you about this character and ship and the entire little sub-fandom that got created around it, and then I want to talk to you more broadly about this entire phenomenon, when fans create an entire canon all to themselves and collectively agree upon things that have nothing to do with the original text. Why does it happen? Why do certain things catch on and certain things don't? And what happens when the stuff fans make up starts to affect the actual work itself? So without further ado, let me tell you about more more. So for those of you who haven't seen BBC Sherlock or my other video on it, the very simple rundown of it is that it's a 2010s modern adaptation of the Sherlock Holmes stories, created by Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss and starring Martin Freeman and Blorbo Cobblepot. It pretty quickly garnered a very large fandom and a very large subsection of that fandom was specifically centered around pairing its two main characters, Sherlock Holmes and John Watson together. There was in fact an entire conspiracy theory that the show was placing an elaborate series of clues into every episode designed to foreshadow to fans that those two were going to get together, which led to a lot of drama and a lot of shit and a huge meltdown when the series finale aired and those two didn't actually get together. If you want to know more, I have a whole video on that. But suffice it to say, the pairing of John Locke made up a very large subsection of the Sherlock fandom. So not all, but most people were largely fixated on the dynamic between those two. On the whole, the Sherlock fandom was very heavily focused on shipping, actually more so than a lot of other fandoms. There were very few fans talking primarily about the show's broader themes or storylines, and that's for a couple fair reasons. The mysteries were mostly episodic, with a new mini-villain and storyline with each one, so they tended to be over and done with pretty quickly. Stephen Moffat writes women pretty awfully, and very few characters are actually friends, so there isn't really much of that to look at. And for the most part, the show itself doesn't really have a huge ton going on, outside the interactions between a few key sets of characters. That paired with the fact that there were only six episodes of the entire show for the majority of its peak on Tumblr meant that a lot of fan activity revolved not around what was actually happening on screen, but what could be happening in a potential future where certain characters got together. And in the case of John and Sherlock, there was a lot of queerbaiting happening. But even beyond those two as a couple, because of the limited amount of content, fans got kind of intense with it. One particular ship featured Sherlock's brother Mycroft and police officer Lestrade, two characters who had never interacted on screen ever for most of the show, to the extent that there are more than 11,000 fics on AO3 that feature them together. It is the second most popular ship for the show on that website. 
The most popular fic on there has more than 10,000 kudos. I've read it, it's well written. But there was this established desire in the fandom to pair certain characters together. Besides Sherlock Holmes and John Watson, another character who became sort of a fan favorite was the show's interpretation of Professor Moriarty, reimagined as this Joker-fied criminal mastermind who runs a network of people who commit illegal acts for hire and who is trying to mess with Sherlock for no reason other than that Moriarty is incredibly smart and incredibly bored with life and wants an intellectual equal to challenge him. He's behind a lot of the plots for the first two seasons and is a figure who kind of exists in the shadows until the end of series one, where he's got this tense confrontation with the main characters and reveals himself. There's a lot of reasons why people, myself included, liked this character. He's a hot villain in a suit, he's often quite flamboyant and heavily queer-coded and also played by a queer actor. The actor Andrew Scott is very clearly having a lot of fun playing him, he's a hot villain in a suit. There's like a sad, fascinating, depressive angle to the character, or would be if the show had a better writer, and he was the catalyst behind a lot of angst in the show's first season. So immediately, a lot of fans latched onto this character. He doesn't have very many actual scenes, but every moment he does appear in was heavily gift, memes were made of most of the character's moments, there was a lot of fic written where the writers just ignored the fact that he died on the show and brought him back no questions asked. Basically, he was a fan favorite. But because so much of this early fandom revolved around shipping, and because of his general demeanor, the most important question loomed for Sherlock fans. Who was Moriarty fucking? Well, who were his options? Sherlock? Maybe. There was a pairing called Shuriarty that shipped those two together, which makes sense. It's a hero-villain ship, they have a lot of tension, there's a lot of stuff building them up as intellectual equals, they both have that, like, you know, dubious morality shit going on. I get it. The ship did exist, and to my knowledge, the fandom for it was really chill, but it never picked up that much steam, largely because John Locke was such a dominating force in the fandom. Moriarty x John Watson was a thing a couple people shipped, but just never really caught on, and those two didn't really have many scenes together or much chemistry. There was a bit of a push to pair him with Molly Hooper, a character whose personality was nice woman with an unrequited crush on Sherlock, mostly because he's introduced by pretending to be her boyfriend, but again, didn't really catch on. <laughs> but we can't not ship this guy with someone, right? <laughs> Based on what I've said so far, and the Onceler video I did, and the fact that the ship is called More More, you might be tempted to think that fans shipped Jim Moriarty with himself, but uh, no, not, not this time. Uh, so fans largely decided to go to the books for this material. So in the books, you have a character named Colonel Sebastian Moran. We know a few things about the character. He's the second most dangerous man in London and works for Moriarty, the first most dangerous man in London. He's well-educated, was in the military, he's a good shot. And there's a story about the character having crawled down a drain after a wounded man-eating tiger and also goes by the code name Tiger. Remember that part specifically. He also has a son, but that doesn't really come up much in the books. He's the antagonist of several of them, and sort of exists as the narrative counterpart to John Watson. Sherlock Holmes has his own sidekick, and Professor Moriarty has his. <laughs> also, fun fact about Sebastian Moran, he's referenced in the incredible Andrew Lloyd Webber fever dream known as Cats. There's a line in the song Gus the Theater Cat about playing a character named Growl Tiger, a character described in the original poem as, he once played a tiger, could do it again, which an Indian colonel pursued down a drain. So literary character Sebastian Moran is canonically part of one of the cats' backstories in Cats. Just felt the need to put that out there. <laughs> but the character of Sebastian Moran was just that, a literary character. He never made it onto the show, never was referenced in any capacity, and there was nothing in BBC Sherlock to imply that Moriarty had a second in command or a sidekick of any kind. But then fans of BBC Sherlock were like, what if we all just collectively pretended he was on the show, and also what if those two were dating? And then fans of BBC Sherlock all just collectively pretended he was on the show. I think what's most fascinating to me about BBC Sebastian Moran as a character is how unified the sort of canon surrounding this character was. It wasn't just, oh, everyone has their own differing interpretations of what a modern day rendition of Sebastian Moran would be like, and it's just a really popular headcanon. No, the parameters of this character were very clear very specific, very codified, and almost universally agreed upon. 
what he looked like, what actor he would be played by, what his personality was, what his relationship with Jim Moriarty was like, what nicknames he used for his husband, what nicknames his husband used for him, what nicknames he used for himself, what his backstory was, what his specific job was in the modern day, down to if he had a child with Moriarty, what the child would be named, and what actor would play the child. Obviously, that's not to say that there was no deviation from this, but it was for the most part very, very specific and very, very universal. And let me be clear, this was not a tiny niche fandom. At least going by AO3 statistics, it's the fifth most popular ship for the show, currently with nearly 4,000 fanfictions about them. Searching more more as a general Google search term isn't too helpful when it comes to pulling up statistics because they'd be confused by the fact that that word means grandma in several languages, but searching the term on on literary oasis Wattpad pulls up nearly 30,000 results. This wasn't huge, but it was by absolutely no means tiny, making the universality of the lore for this ship kind of impressive. This character's phenomenal appearance shouldn't be too surprising to anyone if you've been in fandom for a long enough time and seen humanizations of non-human characters. He was by and large a blonde white man. There were a few fans who interpreted the character as Indian, although not too many. He had scars on his face, so that part was interesting, I guess. The actor who pretty much everyone decided would play Sebastian was Michael Fassbender, known for doing stuff like X-Men and Inglorious Bastards and having restraining orders taken out against him, and people latched on to Michael Fassbender as Sebastian extremely quickly. Even if you just search more and more on Google Images, you'll very, very quickly see a lot of fan-made gift sets imagining scenes of those two interacting. Basically, fans will take a movie Andrew Scott was in and a movie Michael Fassbender was in and find scenes where it looks like the two of them could vaguely be in the same location and make up their own dialogue to add to it. Um, take this one, made up of two separate movies and featuring a little scene of them watching an eclipse. Or this one, where Jim finds Sebastian's ex-girlfriend and calls her a slut or this one where they go camping together and get lost. You would even see fan videos made of these two characters to various songs, once again stitching together scenes from Andrew Scott movies and scenes from Michael Fassbender movies. A really common thing around either new Sherlock fans on Tumblr or just people who weren't super keyed into this element of the fandom would be people seeing videos and gift sets featuring these two and going, wait, Michael Fassbender was in Sherlock? I don't remember that, did I miss it? And it's like, no, no you did not, he was never on the show. On top of his appearance and actor, there were a lot of other agreed upon elements for this character. A couple of them were loosely based on things from the book, the main one being that one of his pet names was almost always, always, always written as Tiger. This was popular enough that just flashing a brief tiger emoji on screen in my TJLC video was enough to signal what ship I was talking about to other people of refined taste, but for the most part, these traits were either created out of thin air or general ideas from the books made very specific. Another one was that, drawing on the book character's history as a marksman, Sebastian Moran was specifically a sniper and was essentially the personal assassin for Jim who doesn't like getting his own hands dirty. Um, that was another thing, uh, the specific subset of this fandom tended to use these characters' first names rather than their surnames as other parts of the fandom did. Um, so Sebastian would also go by Seb, Sebi, or Basher. Um, there weren't really nicknames for Jim, but there would be like a tiger and magpie motif in a lot of these fan works because on the show he does cry to classical bop the thieving magpie. And there tended to be an implicit power dynamic in their relationship in the large majority of fan works as well. Oftentimes, the interpretation of these two characters being together is that the relationship wouldn't necessarily be loving and normative, but rather this somewhat kinky, somewhat codependent dynamic with clear roles and a power differential. A lot of the fan fictions featuring those two as a couple also featured other pairings and mostly just kind of had more and more dating in the background. But when you start looking at the most popular solo fix of those two, it's a lot of either very porny stuff or just stuff that very clearly delineates the roles in the relationship. These Violent Delights by a writer named Pacifile was by far the most popular strictly more morphic. I've read it, it's good, and BDSM is literally the second tag on the thing, so there you go. Back when I was in like junior high or high school and was big into this, I made my own giant ass more playlist back when 8-tracks was a thing. 
And the mix is private now and also 8 tracks is dead, but I still have the entire track list and I feel like you can just decipher the vibes that this ship had based on the song choice. We've got Ludo's Love Me Dead, Pink's Boring, Muse's I Belong to You, somehow a fucking Jeffree Star song ended up on here. Obviously I can't decide, that one's a fucking 2012 villain song classic. Kiss with a Fist, Let's Kill Tonight, you get the vibes, right? You, you get the vibes. <laughs> Toxic codependent murder couple. You did see Fix where the relationship was purely sexual or Sebastian was just being used, but generally the accepted canon with this pairing is that the romantic feelings those two have for each other are perhaps toxic and perhaps unconventional, but nevertheless sincerely held. We not only had these really specific and defined elements about this character and this relationship, but also this canon around Sebastian and Mormor being held up as a sort of defining body around this fandom. One of the things you'll very quickly find in the Mormor tags if you go looking is fans criticizing the way other fans write the characters in ship. Not just because it's personally distasteful to them, but because of the idea that it's out of character for Sebastian or an unfaithful reading of the ship. For instance, you've got this post here that reads, I can't picture people looking at Sebastian and Jim and actually wholeheartedly going, yup, these are the bad guys. Like, their characters are so complex and so much more than just the bad guys, like, especially with Seb which is just fascinating to me. Even though Seb is not actually a character on the show and does not have a canon characterization, here's a person who's frustrated that others misinterpret the character. It's in many ways very similar to some fans' dedication to keeping things accurate to a canon body of work, but in this case that body of work is entirely the creation of other fans. Not only that, but this fanon isn't designed to be supplementary to fandom, it actually supersedes it. The addition of moral complexity into these characters' lives is like the relationship and like Sebastian himself, entirely created by the collective consciousness of a small sliver of the Sherlock fandom, and yet it is treated with not just the same importance, but greater importance than the actual canon. And this is kind of interesting, right? Because like, a lot of the stuff in this ship seems to blatantly contradict what we know of the actual canon of the show. For one, one of the main characterizations that we get out of BBC's Moriarty is that he does not really care about other people or have the capacity or interest for romantic relationships. Our introduction to the character is him getting in a fake relationship with one of the female characters on the show specifically to mess with Sherlock. The character's big death scene is him going on about how nothing in the world is interesting or fulfilling to him anymore and there's just too much shit and he doesn't even want to be around anymore. There's nothing on screen to indicate anything pertaining to the ship, even Moriarty being gay while a popular fan interpretation is only arguably supported by the text and in the actual show is mostly presented as a ruse slash joke, again to throw off Sherlock. It's not that characters being out of character in ships or fanfiction is something new, but generally the way they're out of character is in the opposite way, they're flanderized. Their canonical traits are played up to such a ridiculous extent in fandom that they become parodies of themselves. Think about what happens every time a character says they like a specific food and then 80% of fan works about them include being obsessed with said food and referencing it in some way. But in this case, the out of characterness tended to come in the form of both ignoring existing traits and inventing new ones, so the fact that people were able to collectively agree upon those things is especially fascinating. It was not only inventing this new character and characterization out of very little, but essentially completely reimagining another established character for the purposes of this ship. And I think the reasoning for why is perfectly exemplified after the release of season 3. So a lot of more more stuff came up specifically after Sherlock season 2 because that was really the height of the fandom. There had been this big explosive dramatic finale that prompted questions and fan theories and angst and tons of fix it fix and then there was a literal two year hiatus. The fandom had huge hiatus brain and was going wild with it. And then season 3 started to air and Moran actually showed up in it. Sort of. There was this minor villain character, Lord Moran, who had an evil plot and vanished. And to be clear, this interpretation of Moran was not in line with fandom stuff at all. He was not played by Michael Fassbender, he was barely in the episode, the character had no connection to Moriarty, he wasn't a sniper, he wasn't ex-military in any way whatsoever. Pretty much all he had in common with either Book Moran or More More Moran was the name. But like... This was still huge, right? Moran is canon, he's a real part of Sherlock. The character had nothing to do with fanon, but like, that's fine. So how did fans react to this revelation? Well, they didn't. 
Fans of the Mormor ship almost universally took a look at Lord Moran, shrugged and went, whatever, and then ignored him and proceeded to never mention or reference his existence again and kept on doing their thing. Which, iconic. But it very much demonstrated a key fact about this fandom. It wasn't really about BBC Sherlock at all, it had kind of morphed into its own thing. By and large, primarily Mormor fic doesn't really reference the other Sherlock characters at all. It's not about Sherlock Holmes or John Watson or Molly Hooper or Mycroft or anyone else. It doesn't usually touch on anything that happened in any of the Sherlock episodes, except occasionally exploiting Moriarty's death for angst value. Mostly though, it ignores the fact that he even canonically died at all. Stories were primarily just about those two and their history and the new shit they'd get up to, divorced from a broader story or world or other characters created by Moffat or Gatiss. Proponents of this ship largely were completely uninterested in anything to do with BBC Sherlock, to the extent that even the one character who was actually on BBC Sherlock had a lot of his traits drastically changed. This was not the Sherlock fandom, this was the Mormor fandom. Some of this just came from the fact that you didn't really need to be interested in actual Sherlock to be interested in Mormor. The ship didn't theoretically conflict with any other major pairings, so you could ship John Locke at the same time as shipping Mormor, but it largely had its own subset of dedicated fans who either just liked the kinky crime husbands or who wanted something darker than you'd get from mainstream fan stuff. And after season two, the character of Moriarty was dead anyway and you didn't get much from actually watching the show. So it was very easy for these fanfictions to essentially get wrapped up in their own little world. There was even a subset of that alternate universe, which was basically an alternate universe of an alternate universe. This was a potential world where those two ended up having a child, almost always named Alex, and it would be stories and explorations specifically of their life with that child. Oftentimes, the character of Alex would be in some kind of forbidden Romeo and Juliet style romantic relationship with the hypothetical child of John and Sherlock, who was typically called Hamish based on a throwaway line from the show, and was almost always specifically fancast as Asa Butterfield. So many Asa Butterfield gifts, and <laughs> they haunted me. This isn't anything new. A lot of fandoms have these agreed upon next generation characters with names and fan casts, but usually in the case of fandoms like, say, Harry Potter, they're at least loosely based on existing names or characters. This whole alternate universe was pulled out of very little and yet was remarkably consistent in its fan canon. And as we saw with things like Lord Moran and the insistence of many fans that Mormor stay in character, not to the show, but to the fan created idea of Mormor, this alternate universe was actually treated as more important than the actual show to those fans. But like, how did we get here? How do you go from a mediocre, queer baby BBC show that focuses mostly on Bramblepatch Cinderpelt and Martin Freeman to this very hyper-specific pairing that's created multiple characters who are never on the show and talks about them like they were always there and has absolutely nothing to do with the actual plot and characters? Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining, this pairing dominated my life for ages, but how does this happen? Not only how do we decide to create fanon, but also how do certain traits catch on while others don't? What is this phenomenon? on. In order to answer this question, we'll have to take several steps backward and look beyond just more more and into the world of fanon broadly. Let's talk about what it looks like, some buckwild examples of it, and how and why it happens. So fanon, as its name implies, basically means fan canon. The term arose in the 90s and essentially means any aspect of a work that's mutually agreed upon and engaged with by the fanbase on a wide scale that's actually not canon to the original material. Unlike something like a headcanon, which is someone's personal interpretation or theory toward a work, fanon is kind of a collective mythos believed and consumed by many people. It can range from anything like interpretations of a character's motivation or feelings, belief about a backstory or action that occurred off screen, and especially commonly shipped a lot of shipping fanons. Why fanons happen is a hard thing to answer exactly. Sometimes it can come out of an interest in interpreting aspects of the source material. Um, for example, there's a subset of the Columbo fandom that believes that Columbo's often mentioned but never seen wife isn't real, and he only references having a wife to fuck with the murder suspects. Now, any self-respecting Columbo expert would know that this isn't true, but there are still some people who subscribe to this theory, if for no other reason than the fact that it's fun. Sometimes it's based around a desire to see more done in a given world and setup, like how a large portion of the Inside Out fandom decided to take a bunch of emotion characters that had been cut out of the finished film and decided to incorporate them into their own fan works. 
Sometimes it's just out of a desire to have fun. Like when Lucasfilm canon expert Pablo Hidalgo tweeted out a joke about General Hux having a cat named Millicent, and now there's over 1,000 Star Wars fix on AO3 tagged with the character of Millicent the Cat. And sometimes fanon is just a desire to see something happen that didn't actually end up happening. A ship people prefer, or a story beat the fandom collectively decides to ignore because they didn't like the final season of some Netflix lion mech cartoon. The point that I'm trying to get at here is that sometimes fanon arises out of various needs and desires from a fanbase. The really fascinating thing though is that because every fandom is so uniquely different, every fanon is in its own way also so uniquely different, both in its purposes for existence and in the way that it's spread and adopted by a fanbase. Often by directly examining the fanon beliefs of a franchise, you can really see the history of the fandom as a whole and the way in which time changes up how those ideas are distributed to the masses. And that raises a lot of questions, right? Like for starters, what can we figure out about why fanon happens? Well, there are a few fairly consistent trends here. I mentioned a few examples beforehand, but really I would split fanon into mostly three overarching categories. There's fanon as course correction, where fans correct or modify things in the original narrative that they don't like. There's fanon as expansion of the world, where fans collectively invent ways to fill gaps in a narrative or add to it. And then finally, there's fanon as a community building activity of its own. So in the first case, that's where you have things like fans seeing a decision by a writer that they think is shitty and everyone collectively deciding, nah, that never happened. So for example, a very popular fanon interpretation of the character Chihiro Fujisaki from the Danganronpa games is that Chihiro is a trans woman. The character is canonically a feminine boy who dresses and presents as a girl to avoid being bullied for being feminine, but a lot of people felt like the way Chihiro's arc was written and presented ended up playing into transphobic tropes. So there's a huge subset of this fandom that just accepts and writes Chihiro as being a trans girl. Though obviously, as you can imagine, this is also a huge point of contention in that fandom and was a whole thing, so moving on. Or very minor example, but the character of Castiel on Supernatural canonically goes by Cass as a nickname. Based on Word of God and the actual subtitles and everyone on the show, Cass is spelled with two S's, but fans collectively absolutely fucking hated that. So in pretty much every single post or fanfiction about Castiel that you will ever see, you'll find it spelled Cass with one S instead. This kind of fanon as course correction tends to be fairly simple in its scope because it usually revolves around either changing small details of the story or simply erasing things fans didn't like from the collective fan interpretation of a narrative, so these don't generally tend to be the largest and most widely encompassing versions of fanon. That second category, fanon as expansion of the world, makes up a lot of this stuff, and that's where you get things like, as I said earlier, filling in gaps in the story. Some of this can also include small details, for example, fans agreeing on a specific middle or last name for a character who never canonically got one. Or we can get larger examples of this surrounding entire characters, which is something we see a lot of in a show like Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks was a supernatural mystery series created by David Lynch and Mark Frost that aired in between 1990 and 1991. The show, which began as a simple murder mystery about an FBI agent visiting a small town in order to find out who killed the homecoming queen Laurel Palmer, quickly evolved into something more dramatic and cerebral and, well, weird. Initially extremely popular, this shift into more cosmic territory, as well as a huge drop in quality during the second season due to executive meddling, caused the series to decline in popularity until it was all ultimately cancelled at the end of its second season. However, the fanbase for the show still lived on with a strong cult following, especially because the series ended on a cliffhanger with a lot of unanswered questions still in the air. Lynch was able to make a Twin Peaks film entitled Firewalk With Me, and fans hoped it would answer questions, but uh, instead it was a prequel that actually avoided solving the cliffhanger from the series, and instead deliberately made everything more confusing and inconsistent. Fans at the time loved it isn't the word I would use, and it was the last bit of Twin Peaks people got for a while. During the time where there was no Twin Peaks content, there was a lot of questioning going on in the fandom. What was supposed to happen next? What would season 3 have been like? Did this character survive? Etc. 
But for our purposes, our main concerns are fandom speculations regarding two characters, Diane and Judy. So for context, the closest thing Twin Peaks has to a main character, Dale Cooper, was an eccentric FBI agent who would frequently talk into a tape recorder in order to capture his thoughts on anything going on. This could be anything from documenting new clues found about the Laura Palmer case, to making a note to look more into who shot JFK just for fun, or even just making a note of a really good pie place Cooper found while traveling. However, when Cooper would use his tape recorder, he'd always address his messages to someone named Diane, asking her to get notes for him, take care of paperwork, or even just talking about his feelings to her. Diane was a mystery to viewers. She was a character brought up in almost every episode, but she was never shown on screen, and there wasn't much info really given about her. This led to wild fan speculation regarding who exactly she was and what her relationship to Cooper was like. Cooper is a generally beloved figure in the Twin Peaks fanbase because he's just sort of a gummy bear of a person, so anyone who was theoretically close to Cooper was someone to be invested in. One theory that used to get tossed around is that Diane didn't really exist at all, that Cooper simply called his tape player Diane, or that he decided to pretend he was talking to someone named Diane as some sort of therapy technique. It's not an inherently absurd premise. For starters, Cooper is known for using unconventional methods in his life and work, like deciding if someone is guilty or innocent by seeing whether or not he can hit a glass bottle with a rock when their name is said aloud. Additionally, not only is Diane never seen, but she's not even really mentioned or referred to by anyone else in the show. We don't see Cooper send out the tapes to her, we don't really get any info into what her role is, there's even a deleted scene from Firewalk With Me in which we see Cooper having a conversation with Diane, except Diane is off screen and we never actually hear any responses from her. The other basic alternative is that Diane was real, but that meant trying to come up with an idea of what Diane was like. And that could be a bit different for everyone, but the general interpretation, at least from what I've seen, was that Diane was someone who was maybe overworked, but a very efficient assistant, and overall Cooper's confidant, spiritual guide, and good friend. Here's one thing that makes Twin Peaks really interesting, though. While it started in a mostly pre-internet era, it did in fact eventually get a continuation 25 years later in the form of Twin Peaks the Return, which is either a third season of the show or an 18-hour feature film, depending on what critic you talk to. By this point, the Twin Peaks fandom had shifted from Usenet and LiveJournal to Reddit and Tumblr, so finally, after 25 years, the fans could get answers to things they had wondered about, and in this case, that also includes Diane. So after 25 years, she finally makes her in-the-flesh appearance on Twin Peaks, and she's nothing like anyone imagined. Portrayed by the always fantastic Laura Dern, Diane Evans is a mean, bitter woman wearing unnatural wigs and gaudy fashion who chain smokes and almost exclusively says swears. My attitude is none of your fucking business. Fuck you, Albert. What'd you say your name was again? Tammy. Fuck you, Tammy. And it was not really the characterization fans were expecting. And while some of Diane's behavior and persona would be explained by revelations throughout the season that she wasn't always quite like this, something that some fans still take umbrage with is the idea that Diane and Cooper had a romantic history and they, semi-spoilers, end up being the closest thing the show has to a canonical end couple. There's a lot of reasons why some fans don't really like this. Like, some of it is because it gets in the way of incredibly popular ships like Cooper x Audrey Horn and Cooper x Harry Truman. Some of it was that people felt like it came out of nowhere. For others, it's because it went against their perception of Diane and Cooper's relationship, with prevailing fan interpretations not being that these were two people with romantic tension, but two people who were extremely close friends and trusted each other. Even now, while people generally love Laura Dern's portrayal of the character, her relationship with Cooper is still a hotly contested issue, and because it's Twin Peaks, there's a lot of speculation and theorizing to try and figure out the ideal way to interpret it. On on the whole, this is kind of an interesting case study for where the fanon surrounding a character later starts to conflict with their canon portrayal. But then there's also Judy, which is… Mm. So, Judy was first mentioned in Firewalk With Me during a throwaway line where David Bowie walks into the FBI offices and yells out loud in a Cajun accent, I'm not going to talk about Judy. In fact, we're not going to talk about Judy at all. We're going to keep her out of it. And then a bunch of B-roll and ominous random sentences are said, and he disappears, and nobody speaks of it again, save for a monkey appearing out of nowhere to say the name Judy near the end of the film. 
This was weird even by Twin Peaks standards. And so for years, people desperately tried to figure out who or what Judy was. Next to the murder of Laurel Palmer, it might be the biggest mystery in the Twin Peaks fanbase. Additional things would give more context to Judy. A version of the shooting script leaked online, which contained a scene of Bowie's character, Philip Jeffries, entering a hotel and asking the front desk if a Mrs. Judy had checked in. It also contained a reference to Jeffries visiting Judy in Seattle and the idea that Judy had a sister. Then later on when being interviewed, one of the writers of Twin Peaks, Robert Engel, said it was possible that Judy was meant to be the twin sister of Josie Packard, one of the main characters from the original series. Which makes sense. Josie did actually go to Seattle in season one, and she was heavily involved in organized crime. Plus, her subplot was one of the more soap opera-y out of everyone else's, so her having a surprise twin out of nowhere wouldn't be too far-fetched for the character. This theory was seemingly confirmed by Josie's actress, Joan Chen, writing an honestly buck-wild open letter to David Lynch written from the point of view of Josie stuck in a wooden doorknob and asking for her twin sister Judy to appear in Twin Peaks The Return. Joan Chen wasn't in Twin Peaks The Return. Anyway, the point is that for years, the common consensus in the fandom was that if Judy wasn't a metaphor or one of the other murder victims in the series, then she was a real flesh and blood person and Josie's twin sister who was involved in the organized crime plot and maybe was involved in the grander events of Laura Palmer's murder. People would still debate over Judy and what she meant and what those scenes were supposed to be, especially as more and more info came out, but for the most part, people had a general idea. And then in Twin Peaks The Return, spoilers, it turns out Judy is is actually not a flesh and blood person, but rather a thousand year old demonic entity named Jode that feasts on human suffering, might have created the original series main antagonist Bob using the pain and horror created by the first nuclear bomb testing, and has probably been in the show the entire time because she assumed the form of a cockroach frog and crawled inside the mouth of one of the leads. So you know, people were a little off. This kind of led to a shifting of Fanon, as now instead of speculating about Judy as a living person, we now have a lot more leads to go off of and be confused about and argue over online. Despite Twin Peaks not being the kind of show to provide a lot of answers and Judy never quite being fully explained on screen, there is still a common consensus over exactly who she is and what role she plays in the plot, even if there's still debates about what exactly she did throughout the series or in the ending. On the whole, the ability for this kind of fanon to fill in existing gaps makes it a really fascinating tool for expansion of fictional worlds in fan communities, and it's especially interesting when it kind of comes toe-to-toe -to -toe with canon in that way. This form of fanon can also look like adding things to a narrative that just flesh out the world a little bit more. My deepest apologies for bringing up Harry Potter, but one of the most popular elements in a lot of fan fictions is a spell called the Notice Me Not charm that lets people pass by relatively undetected. Not invisible, but just unnoticed. Doctor Who actually has that as an explicit part of their canon. Pretty much any fanfiction you can find references this charm specifically by the name Notice Me Not charm, and it's all over in fanfiction, and yet it doesn't exist in the original works at all. It's completely fanon. There are spells that are vaguely similar to this concept, but they don't go by that name, and it's more like for buildings than people. This one has taken over the fandom so definitively that you very, very often see people expressing sincere surprise that it isn't actually in the works. Tons of posts of people going, what? I was so sure this was canon. Or one kind of fandom that existed as a form of speculation was the character of Tad Strange on the kids mystery show Gravity Falls. Basically, the actor Cecil Baldwin, famous for starring in the surreal podcast Welcome to Night Vale, was preemptively credited as playing a character named Tad Strange. And then Gravity Falls' creator did a Reddit AMA from the perspective of the show's villain, a triangle-shaped demon named Bill Cipher, and was asked about Tad Strange and referred to him as a real square. So then, everyone collectively decided Tad Strange was the square-shaped counterpart to Bill Cipher, and there was tons of fan art pairing them together, and there was so much excited speculation for when Tad Strange was going to come, and there was Tad Strange fanfiction and ask blogs, and it was a whole thing, and then Tad Strange popped up in the show, and he was a bit character with one line, where the whole joke was that he was a bland, regular human man. Fans were generally fairly disappointed about this, but you still have this whole body of Tad Strange work to this day. It was an attempt to speculate and get excited, and also to build on the world of Gravity Falls to what people felt was its logical conclusion. All in all, this form of fanon is generally considered supplementary to the world, rather than attempting to modify or replace parts of it. 
But then, finally, you have the third kind of fanon, these forms of fanon that seem to become fandoms of their own. And this is what you really see with stuff like Mormor, or characters like Roxel from Kingdom Hearts. For those who don't know, Kingdom Hearts is a game series that originally debuted in 2002 with the release of the first game called, well, Kingdom Hearts. The game was a crossover between Final Fantasy and Disney, using characters and worlds from both franchises as well as original creations in order to tell a grand, epic JRPG story about fighting a bunch of monsters called Heartless. It was popular and critically acclaimed and certainly had a fan base, but it wasn't until the third game in the series, Kingdom Hearts 2, where it felt like things really, really took off. Kingdom Hearts 2 took the series in a new direction, with more of an emphasis on original characters, a generally darker story, and a lot more complex themes. Particularly of note was the inclusion of Organization 13, the main antagonists of the game. Originally introduced in the second game, Chain of Memories, Organization 13 was a group of people called Nobodies, beings that had formed when their original selves were killed and turned into Heartless. Because of this, you had people who were essentially bodies left behind without heart and without the ability to feel emotions, who feel a lot of emotion about the fact that they're unable to feel emotions. So much so that their grand evil plan is to try and use Kingdom Hearts in order to give themselves hearts so that they can feel like people again. So you had the introduction of 13 hot, villainous emo characters with tragic backstories who suffered from angst over their inability to feel feelings as well as the state of their existence whose end goal could be characterized as morally gray. And yeah, this was a recipe for teenage obsession. <laughs> it's important to note that Kingdom Hearts 2 came out around 2006, which was an era defined find a lot by DeviantArt, Fanfiction.net, MySpace, and Hot Topic. This was the age for emo kids and for emo kid expression, and by god people got it. This was the age where people would unironically make Kingdom Hearts AMVs set to Linkin Park or My Chemical Romance. This was the age of edge and emotions and feelings and darkness, so yeah, of course there was a lot of fan work about Organization 13. Of course there was. Some of it was just basic fix, giving them more time in the spotlight. Some were about Organization 13 OCs. And then of course, there was a shit ton of shipping. I'm not sure if you know this, but Kingdom Hearts actually has a really prominent yaoi fan base. The male-male pairings take up a large portion of the fandom. It's basically impossible to avoid. The most popular ship is still the one between best friends slash occasional rivals slash main characters Sora and Riku, which is understandable as the anime best friend rival trope is basically guaranteed to generate ships. Narumitsu is canon, by the way. But following behind in a very close second place is Roxas and Axel. So Roxas is one of the main playable characters in Kingdom Hearts 2 and the main character Sora's nobody. That's why his name is Roxas, because it's an anagram of Sora, but with an X added. His whole thing was that he was an organization member that had at one point defected from the group and lost his memory. When we meet Roxas, he's been placed inside of a virtual world, convinced he's just a normal teenage boy having a great summer vacation with his school friends. However, his fake vacation is interrupted by this character named Axel, who was originally introduced in Chain of Memories, but gets more depth here. Apparently, while they were in the organization, Axis and Roxel were very good friends, and when Roxas defected, it really hurt Axel. Axel on a personal emotional level because they really were just such good friends. Axis spends the prologue of Kingdom Hearts 2 trying to get Roxas to remember, showing up to fight him, and attempting to get him out of the simulation. Axel fails though as Roxas's true fate was revealed. In order for the main character of Sora to awaken from his system reset coma, Roxas would have to sacrifice himself, merge into Sora, and cease being his own person. This of course angers Axel even more and causes him to antagonize Sora up until until the end where he sacrifices himself to save Sora as Sora reminds him of Roxas, his dying words being, he made me feel like I had a heart. You know, very good friends, super good friends. <laughs> Fans went nuts over these two, and yeah, obviously. Here you had Roxas, an angsty emo amnesiac boy played by teenage heartthrob Jesse McCartney, and Axel, his edgy friend who would do anything to save him. You had death, you had erasure from existence, you had this at the time off-screen backstory of how these two met and what made them so close. It was everything a teenage shipper could dream of. 
So it wasn't long until the fan base decided that these two Disney video game characters were fucking. There was a lot of fan content about that in basically any way possible, any setting possible, including one really infamous fic at the time, which placed the Organization 13 characters in World War II. Do not read it if you know you know. The point I'm getting at is that the fandom took this pairing in as many directions as they could, but eventually you get sort of bored of just your fanon relationships being stagnant. There's only so many ways you can write Axel x Roxas. I mean, these are both young men. Don't you want to see them grow up and face the next phase of their life? Enter Roxel, the child of Roxas and Axel. I fucking love Roxel. I love everything about him. <laughs> he originally debuted on DeviantArt, and I mean this in the most supportive way when I say you can tell. <laughs> you can absolutely tell. What makes Roxel interesting is that he was from this era where people would make fan art of child characters and they'd literally just like drag and drop the attributes of both parents over. So Roxel has both Roxas's blonde hair and Axel's red hair stacked on top of each other like a Yu-Gi-Oh character. He has Axel's face tattoos and he wears an outfit that combines both Axel and Roxas's clothes. Like they legit just blendered these two together. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Unlike something like more more. While Roxel had a character design, he didn't really have much in the way of consistent lore or backstory or anything like that. The main thing that would always be slightly different is how Roxel came to be. A lot of the time it would be via Mpreg, sometimes it would be because of cloning, sometimes it was because of weird nobody heartless bullshit, and sometimes Roxel just existed, no questions asked. Roxel was also often paired up with Soku, Sora and Riku's child, which also just looked like Sora and Riku got smashed together, with their dynamic either being like siblings or lovers, depending on the fan work. One of the things that's really interesting about Roxel is that, as I said earlier, Kingdom Hearts 2 came out during the hot topic internet era, which meant that a lot of Roxel content is based on sites like DeviantArt and fanfiction.net and LiveJournal. Looking back on it is like looking back at this great time capsule of older fandom spaces, spaces populated primarily by teenagers just trying to have fun with their two dead gay villain boys. It's like the fan art equivalent of the When We Were Young concert line. Lineup. It basically comes with free eyeliner. And I think what really sets this kind of fanon apart from the other two types is that it's not either correcting canon or building onto it. In fact, it seems almost unconcerned with canon, or at least with the parts of canon that can't be used to supplement the alternate universe. On top of the examples I've already shown, you see a lot of that in fan bases like, for example, Undertale, where multiple alternate universes like Underfell, where the characterization was completely different and characters had entirely new designs and personalities collectively agreed upon by tens of thousands of people. That one even had fan games created specifically for this fan and alternate universe. These are just a few examples, and these things have existed for a very long time, but generally the gist is that these forms of fandom tend to be very expansive and tend to be created kind of for their own sake. It's not about doing something to canon, it's about creating a new canon of their own. And so I think these ones are the forms of fandom that are especially fascinating to me. The fact that there can be more and more fans who are not Sherlock fans or Underfell fans who are not Undertale fans is frankly such an interesting testament to how we respond to specific pieces of media and the general act of responding to creation with creation. These decentralized works constitute specific collective forms of creating and community outside the influence of the existing canon, and creating within that space is therefore often an end unto itself. And what's interesting enough is that sometimes these decentralized works and parts of fandom can escalate to the point of just being wild misinformation on the internet. And for this, we have to look at the draft Dragon Ball fandom, and hold on, sorry, what does this say? Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha, I get to write about DBZ on this channel, and now Sarah has to read it aloud and pretend that they know what they're talking about. Ha 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 ha, this is great. I can't believe Sarah is paying me to force her to say Dragon Ball shit. Ha 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 ha. Cool. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Okay, so as we all know, the early 2000s were basically the height of Dragon Ball's popularity overseas in North America. It was going strong on Toonami, it was getting a shit ton of merchandise, and more and more content from it was getting localized. The localization is a really interesting point here because for all you young children in the audience, back then it took forever for anime and manga to make its way out of Japan. Like, DBZ started airing in Japan in 1989, but never actually aired in North America until 1996 when the series was finally done 
airing back in Japan. And then, despite the series being finished, it took seven years for the entire series to be localized. Another point of note is that the early 2000s anime scene was sort of the Wild West. There weren't really a lot of official outlets. Well, there were, but they were often not fully up to date with everything, and often wouldn't have the type of content that fans wanted. People curious about what parts of Dragon Ball were out in Japan weren't going to find any answers on the English Dragon Ball website, because that was only going to cover what had aired in the US so far, and also was designed for 8 year olds. Because of this, early DBZ fandom relied heavily on fan sites, magazines, and word of mouth when it came to figuring out what all Dragon Ball content was out there, and what was coming up next. And considering that this was the early 2000s and there was no easy way to really verify any claim and anyone could just set up a GeoCities or Angel Fire page and start talking about how Vegeta totally says homophobic slurs in the Japanese version of DBZ episode 30, well, who was going to correct them? Someone who knew Japanese and had a tape of the original Japanese audio of the episodes? Good luck finding any fact checkers. All this misinformation and confusion over what was real and what was not eventually led to the urban legend Dragon Ball AF. In the late 90s, an image began circulating of the character Son Goku in supposedly a Super Saiyajin 5 transformation with the logo Dragon Ball AF in the bottom right corner. No one really quite knew exactly where this sketch came from, and for years, people assumed it was from a full Dragon Ball AF fan comic. But then more Dragon Ball AF stuff continued to be made. Images began being passed around of Vegeta in Saiyajin King armor and a Super Saiyajin for Son Gohan, which were made by a Japanese fan art company, but looked so high quality that fans took them and assumed they were official promo material. This fueled people's curiosity even more, and pretty soon word began to spread about DBAF and how it was either about to air or had already aired years ago, and how they had a friend in Japan who watched the entire series. People wrote out full fake episode lists with full detailed descriptions about what happened in them, shared around story beats, and talked about the new characters that were added. And no one was all the wiser, because there weren't really any easy places to look to find out that this was all bullshit. Even prominent DBZ fan site Daisenshu X got in on it, with their 2004 April Fool's prank being an announcement about Dragon Ball AF with a full promo poster and announcement trailer that they made themselves. And they specifically relied on nobody in the fandom being able to understand Japanese to get away with it, because if someone was fluent in the language, then they could see that the promo poster was just a letter to Toye asking not to be sued and all the stuff in the trailer was just random lines they pulled from other anime the DBZ voice actors had been in and occasional title cards with kanji that talks about how dumb the Dragon Ball AF rumor is and saying that you're stupid if you believed it. And um, a bunch of people in the fandom ended up believing it. It got to the point where the official Dragon Ball Z American website designed for 8 year olds had to update their FAQ to confirm that Dragon Ball AF was fake. Despite this, the fan belief and interest in DBAF continued, with even more absurd new transformations, story arc ideas, and characters. The most popular original character was by far Zykor. Zykor was apparently Goku's evil third son, made after the Western Supreme Kai turned evil and stole some of Goku's DNA after he had defeated Frieza and fused it with her own, and he looks like this, which I think you should just take in for a second. Okay, good. The Western Supreme Kai and Zykor make their way to Earth after the events of Dragon Ball ZT and basically just fuck shit up and be incredibly strong. The only way the heroes can stop Zykor is to temporarily seal him in this sword, upon which the heroes have one month to prepare for his return, and the only way they can do that is by reviving Broly, and like, this sucks. <laughs> Zykor and DBAF as a whole really is a good personification of what the Dragon Ball fandom was all about back then. This emphasis on new transformations, plots adjacent to evil Goku, creating the most powerful villains possible, and Broly. This is the era where a certain subset of fans just really wanted all the characters to be badass and look badass and have as many muscle bulges as they possibly could. And unlike something like Roxel, which was shared through traditional fandom avenues with the idea that it wasn't real, Zykor got spread around through word of mouth with the full belief being that Zykor was a real character who was going to show up at any moment. Zykor is a testament to the age of fandom misinformation. Interestingly enough, a Japanese webcomic artist named Toibull would take all of these rumors and make their own fan comic version of Dragon Ball AF, which followed the general fandom consensus of AF storyline and included Zykor as the main antagonist. 
And there's a 99% chance that this webcomic gave Toybull, now going by Toyotaro, the attention and acclaim he needed to be hired to be the writer and artist of the official Dragon Ball Super manga, which serves as the actual follow-up to Dragon Ball Z. And while Zykor doesn't appear there, both the super manga and anime do have a villain that's half Goku, half Kai that the characters have a limited time frame to beat and ends up being defeated by a sword. So that's something. So where does this kind of fanon come from? Where do we get it? Well, some of this partly depends on the era of the internet some of this fanon arose from. <laughs> It's hard to believe, but fandom actually did exist long before the internet. The thing that's neat about the kind of pre-internet era of fandom and fandom is that because it was such a world where internet use wasn't normalized and widespread, fans would often only really be able to share their beliefs and opinions and theories by meeting in person or going to conventions or writing in magazines. With information being hard to obtain and even harder to share, a lot of fanon beliefs that arose during this era are generally more low-key. Like, rather than doing particularly expansive stuff like more more, common fanon things tended to be more about filling in gaps and holes rather than creating something out of thin air. You know, things like names and whatnot. In the sort of earlier, less centralized and capitalism rotted internet. <laughs> this became complicated by the fact that with examples like Zycor, things were sometimes hard to fact check and so misinformation kind of turned into fanon. And because a lot of fandom in the early ages of internet use didn't really exist on those kinds of platforms we have now, a lot of fandoms tended to rely more heavily on the influence of a few big name fans, which is where we see a lot of this fanon come from always, but especially earlier on. Again, my apologies for bringing up Harry Potter, but you saw this a lot in the olden days of that fandom, back when Cassandra Clare was just a big name fan known for getting into drama and not a wealthy, successful YA author. Her best known fanfic at the time, the Draco trilogy, described Blaze Zabini, one of the side characters in the books, as being pale and white, and so Blaze was almost universally written as pale and white throughout Harry Potter fanfiction in the early to mid 2000s, until he was later revealed to be a black character. And of course, some fans were racist about their fan and perceptions not matching the character because of course they were. Also, fun fact, Blaise's gender wasn't initially stated, so some fans, including Claire herself, read him as a girl and shipped Blaise with other main characters. After he was revealed to be male, a lot of fans turned Daphne Greengrass, a character who has like one mention ever in the series and no canon personality, and made up this personality for her as a cold and calculating mean girl and sort of created a new Blaze. It's actually fairly similar to the whole more more thing, albeit with less defined and expansive lore. Or another example of big name fans dictating fanon, the character of Dawn's middle name on Buffy being Marie came from a specific fan and got broadly adopted by other fans after the fact, to the extent that her actual Wikipedia page uses Marie as her middle name and when fandom's biggest mistake Joss Whedon was asked about the middle name at a convention, decided to canonize it. In this way, you could almost argue that even though this fanon isn't bound to the centralized constraints of a canon work, it still adheres to it in some ways, in this case by still being reliant on the word of influential individuals to dictate what can and can't be part of fanon. Other times, things get decided by a broader collective based on small details in a narrative that can be easily extrapolated outward. This could look like fans deciding that Buffy Summer's full first name is Elizabeth because it's easy to get the Buffy nickname from that, and that interpretation taking hold in a lot of fan and fanfiction spaces. In any case, whether brought forth by one big name fan or a collective, fanon nevertheless occupies this really interesting space when it comes to the text. It often has its own set of rules and parameters in the same way that canon does, but theoretically exists without requiring higher authority to legitimize it. I mean, it oftentimes directly flies in the face of that author legitimization by contradicting canon. And on one hand, that can absolutely be cool as hell. Oftentimes, these fanon worlds create expansions or arguably improvements upon the original text, and once again, the mere act of creating in a decentralized collective is in and of itself fun and valuable. It definitively proclaims that when works of fiction are put out there, they now belong to fans to do with as they please. And whether or not this is an interpretation that you like or agree with, it is transformative to the highest degree, beyond the kind of transformation you get from individual headcanons or fanfiction. That's pretty cool. 
On the other hand, the fact that Fanon often becomes a canon of its own comes with concerns as well. I mean, think about that post criticizing certain interpretations of Mormor for being incorrect or out of character. When a specific interpretation of a character becomes the dominant one, the culture of Fanon can end up replicating the same dynamics of authorial intent, where there's a very strict canon that you need to adhere to at all costs. The only difference is that it's being reinforced by fans and not reinforced by an author. You see this in virtually every fandom, people complaining that certain characters are universally misinterpreted by the fandom and that narrow interpretation of them is treated as the default one, to the extent where creators will be criticized for writing out of character works simply for not adhering to fanon. This can be especially frustrating when the fanon itself has reasons to be criticized. One of the things I remember from my time in the Mormor fandom is that many of the few people who wanted to write Sebastian as a person of color had a hard time having their works gain traction in the fandom because they weren't adhering to the fan and blonde white man conception that had been decreed as the one true way to do things. I even saw some people get sent hate over it. So, um, with those possible pitfalls of fanon in mind, let's talk about June Egbert. So before I begin making the Beetlejuicean mistake of talking about Homestuck a third time, I want to address something. <laughs> Last time I talked about the trans representation in Homestuck, I got a lot of people, including a Homestuck 2 writer, saying that I'm cisgender and therefore not allowed to comment on the subject, despite the fact that I was very open about my very trans co-writer Emily having written that entire section discussing trans issues. People who did acknowledge that I said Emily wrote that entire part would also then accuse me of using Emily as a shield or hiding behind the I have a trans friend defense, despite the fact that I said that Emily wrote and edited that whole section herself. So if I may have a moment, I'd like to clarify some things, and by that I mean I would like Emily to clear up some things. <clears throat> I am the trans co-writer Emily, who is trans and has been openly trans for years now. I am writing this entire section all on my own using my own thoughts and feelings on the matter, and I am simply having these words come out of Sarah's mouth, who has never once interfered or changed up any of my opinions regarding trans representation nor has ever used me to sign off on any trans take they have in order to use my gender identity as a personal defense. These are the actual words and feelings of a trans woman, and you can send your discourse to at Great Cheshire on Twitter if you really have any issues with this, you goddamn vultures. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's move on. I need like a little, like a little sticker that just says I'm, I'm the vessel of Emily right now. Emily is speaking through me. I need like a, like a hat to put on while I'm Emily. So if you're not caught up to speed, I made an entire video on the once popular webcomic Homestuck last year, and it got a lot of attention. Good attention, bad attention, the type of attention I probably can't talk about legally, it was a time. But despite all of the drama that came out of that video, I'm still really proud of it. I think Sarah and I, uh, well, Emily and I, agree that it's the most fun we've had doing a video. But if there's one thing I sort of regret, it's that I wish I had gone more in depth regarding June Egbert, or at least have weighed in more of my actual thoughts on the matter. For those not in the know, June Egbert is the fan-created trans version of John Egbert, the original protagonist of Homestuck. A fair number of fans, specifically trans fans, read through Homestuck and saw a lot of characteristics in John that they related to in their pre-transition selves, specifically John's struggle with his own desires and wants and inability to relate to his father and traditionally masculine subject matter. Eventually, people began speculating or imagining that the character of John was trans and began making art and fan works of a female version of John, who eventually got the gender bent name June. There is so much June content out there, from fan art to June based fanfics that are hundreds of thousands of words long. Things would escalate though when Homestuck creator and person who writes emails exactly like you'd expect someone who wrote Homestuck to write emails, Andrew Hussey, started this ARG thing where they hid a bunch of Toblerones around and whoever found one would be granted a wish from them. One fan on Twitter found a Toblerone and wished for June to be canon, and Hussey said it would be done, and then June fans rejoiced. Here it was, the creator, the clown themselves, confirming that June Egbert was going to be canon. In a better story, this would be it. Everyone would be happy, and and we'd all go home. But this is post-canon Homestuck, meaning the only possible route is disappointment and arguing. Even now, the fandom is very divided on June. As I said in that earlier Homestuck video, some of this is just because of people being transphobic and not wanting to see trans characters in Homestuck, which, you know, isn't cool, fuck that. 
But there's also a tendency from some fans of June Egbert to sort of fit anyone who isn't 100% on board with the headcanon into the mold of intolerant transphobe, which isn't always necessarily true. A big part of this divide is just looking at how the fandom should even treat John Egbert right now. Because of the fact that June was technically declared canon over Twitter, people who support June tend to get upset at anyone referring to John Egbert as John Egbert and anyone not using she, her pronouns for John, even though June hasn't yet actually appeared in canon, John hasn't transitioned in canon, and even if he did get to transition in canon, we don't really know what June's pronouns would be, so trying to insist fans use a certain name and pronouns for a character that's not even using those name and pronouns is honestly kind of buck wild to me. There have been some attempts at compromise by just referring to the character as Egbert and using they them pronouns, but that's honestly not super practical and doesn't really end up satisfying anyone in the argument. And one of the big points of contention when it comes to this character of June Egbert is the idea of people calling June Egbert a retcon. The idea from some supporters of the headcanon is that if you say June is a retcon, what you're implying is that a trans person must always be trans and must always have signs of having been trans throughout their life, and that if a person transitions later on, they're not really trans and you're being transphobic toward June because you're saying that June later decided to be trans and wasn't always and you're mad at her for coming out. Which is just kind of a, a wild thing to take away from that, because no, that's not what calling it a retcon means. You know, for starters, June isn't a real person. Obviously a person who transitions in real life was always trans, even before they realized it, but June doesn't operate of her own free will. June slash John is a character who was written by someone who decided all the choices this character would undergo. The aspect of the character's personality, the character's backstory, and where they would end up, and Hussey has made it very clear that they didn't have a trans narrative in mind when they initially wrote Homestuck. By the very basic definition of a retcon, you know, retroactively applying something to continuity, June is a retcon. No matter whether you love June or you hate June, that's just a very simple textbook fact. And retcon as a word isn't inherently good or bad, nor does it have to mean bad storytelling. It just means something that wasn't intended from the beginning and then was applied later, which is exactly what June is. For the record, I want to say that I'm glad there are people who are fans of June Egbert. I think it's cool that they were able to identify heavily with the character and relate it to their own experiences, and I support them exploring this idea in their own fan works, or excitedly waiting for June to hopefully show up in canon if you still believe that Homestuck 2 is ever going to finish and come out. I support trans headcanons and fanons, and I, aka my co-writer Emily, have made a few myself. Truth be told, I don't really care if June shows up in regular Homestuck or not. June showing up wouldn't bother me or frustrate me in any way. But what is notable is the fact that June hasn't shown up. I want to like I want to create a little hypothetical scenario. Let's imagine that there's this other long-running series and it's written by a person named, I don't know, J.K. Rowling. And after finishing up the original parts of her series, J.K. Rowling puts out a statement saying that a prominent character in the series named I don't know, Dumbledore or some dumb shit like that is gay. And this is a bit strange for some fans because despite some moments that sort of had gay undertones, Dumbledore's sexuality was never explicitly mentioned or explored in the original text, making its authenticity in the canon as well as the quality of its representation debatable. And this hypothetical author named J.K. Rowling releases more and more media in that universe to mixed response and backlash, including some that directly feature said character Dumbledore in a personal story that could potentially be used to explore his homosexuality. But instead, there's just maybe some vague little nods to it, and it's still not really addressed nor explicitly shown on screen, meaning the knowledge of Dumbledore's sexuality relies entirely on outside statements from the author rather than anything you can point to that's tangible or empowering. Now, in that hypothetical situation, you wouldn't really call that good gay representation, right? Nor would you be mad at people who criticized fictional author J.K. Rowling for retconning in this character background trait but never actually exploring it. In fact, you'd probably be clowning on it too, right? And so that sort of raises the question in terms of this interpretation of June and whether it's wrong not to interpret the character presently as a trans woman, why is that any different? Because all that we've seen so far in our canonical existence is that original tweet and two vague in-story nods that you might not have even realized were supposed to tie into any trans stuff if you didn't know about June and the Toblerone thing. 
Maybe Homestuck 2 would have done more with her, but we don't know for sure, and we probably never will because I don't believe anyone is actually working on that anymore. June Egbert, for me, represents the ups and downs of fanon characters. On one hand, she can be a symbol of fan joy and expression, the ability for fandoms to take the original work and find unexpected ways to identify with it, and then use that for the basis of their own creations and maybe even their own personal journeys. On the other hand, it also represents weaponized fandom how a fandom that has rallied fully behind a certain idea can be hostile to others who don't share the same appreciation for it or have any criticism at all towards the direction of the fanon. It's turning something that might have once been a genuine expression of one's connection to a particular character and headcanon into a way to attack others in order to make up for the fact that the people in charge of making content about this haven't given you anything but subpar allusions to it and expected you to be satisfied. Anyway, Emily out. Back to me, Sarah, being in control of what I myself am saying. <laughs> so on one hand, fanon exists as this space separate from and challenging sole ownership of the author over how a work is read and engaged with, but on the other hand, in some cases, it can in and of itself kind of replicate that hegemony. It's really interesting, and that tension becomes especially clear when fanon starts to actually affect the original work. One of the most common examples people give is the time Stargate fans decided on a first name for a specific character, and then years later the writers actually gave said character that name. The same thing happened to Ahura on Star Trek. But other examples include Hamish and Effie in the Hunger Games movies being implied to get together because that ship had become popular fan and among book fans, the show Buffy making two different characters who were played by the same actor canonically the same person because fans had decided that they were, or later tours of the Broadway musical Be More Chill heavily implying one of the characters was canonically queer because that had become fanon. There are tons more examples than this, but the gist is that fanon can become popular and all-consuming enough to actually impact the original work, and that's honestly impressive. I started this video out by talking about More More, and that's because that fandom and that ship was personally my first introduction to the concept of fanon and how wide and spanning and honestly totally unrelated to the original media it can become. That fanon took a character who never existed on a given show, made up an appearance and nicknames and a personality and a job and a child and a relationship dynamic for him, and acted like he existed all along. Nothing else was relevant, not even some version of the character actually appearing on the show and contradicting the fan culture. And I do think More More in particular really sheds a light on why and how fanon happens. Beyond wanting to change or expand elements from the original work, the actual act of collective creation is something that's existed for as long as humanity has, far beyond the confines of the internet or broader fandom. For as long as people have been sitting around fires and telling stories, we've been making up entire worlds and characters and relationships, oftentimes based on existing factors, but having grown and changed so much beyond them. This isn't new, but the existence of fanon as a much more contemporary iteration of that human need to collectively create is exceptionally fascinating to me. Not only that, but the fact that fanon exists both as a response to the confines of a strict and defined canon but also part of it is incredibly interesting too. By nature, it tends to come with its own constraints and its own rules and its own parameters, and that's something that certainly isn't inherently bad but does present problems when people in a fan community are harassed or punished for not adhering to very specific fanon. Fan communities largely exist to transform and reflect on original works, and when we set specific parameters of how exactly you are able to transform it, it might become antithetical to the original purposes of those communities. That's not to say fanon is strictly good because it taps into the need to collectively create and challenge authorial intent, or strictly bad because it can itself feed into those same problems, but rather that it's a complex and fascinating and often wild and crazy thing with a long history and a long way to go. And no matter what we decide to canonize next, some small part of my soul will forever remain bound to more more. Speaking as someone who's recently gotten back into writing fanfiction and uh, has written a lot of words and I'm only 40% of the way through, oh my god, please help, 
Helping myself become a more productive person has become huge in pushing myself there. And when I see the lengths of impressive and detailed stuff made by fans, that kind of drive and creativity is something that I really do admire and try to work toward. And that's why I'm sincerely really, really happy to talk about Fabulous, the sponsor for this video, because it's actually an app I've been using myself for over half a year now, way before I knew that they were going to sponsor me. So basically, Fabulous is an app that helps you build better personal habits and achieve your goals. And the good thing is that it's really complicated comprehensive and customizable. It focuses on helping you improve your physical health, mental health, mindfulness, and good habits. And it's based on behavioral science and lets you kind of go at your own pace. One of the big things that I use it for is helping myself create a daily routine because obviously my job can be unstructured and relies really heavily on having to self-motivate. So having that outside factor help me build simple habits like drinking water as soon as I wake up and going for walks at certain times is honestly a huge help for me and just makes me feel a lot better and more productive. If you're interested in trying Fabulous, go to the fab.co slash Sarah Z or just click the link in my description. The first 500 people who click that link will get 25% off a fabulous premium subscription. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to specially thank Cordy's Chords, Vocazone, Roman Antonacci, Clayton and Claire Page, and Kevin Lippis. Thank you so much and welcome.